From Rixie, this is Frameform, a show about movies, moving, and everything in between. I'm Hannah Weber. I'm Jen Ray. And I'm Claire Schweitzer. Hey, Frameform listeners, we have another great guest today, Stephen Butler. This is part of a series of interviews produced in collaboration with Screen Dance Forum and Dance Cinema. It was recorded in August 2019 at Cascadia Dance and Cinema Festival in Vancouver, BC, Canada. We talk about Stephen's creative career and process and enjoy a lot of insights and laughs along the way. Enjoy. Today we are with filmmaker, dancer, the everyman, I would say. Stephen. Everyman. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Butler at the Cascadia Dance and Cinema Festival. Festival in Vancouver. Um, Woohoo! We also got Jen Ray. Jen, take it away. So, first a primer. Uh, Stephen has been a Cascadia loyal since year two. He, we've screened his films, the Confrontation. We screened Tellurian last year. Um, it's been really exciting for him to become more involved with the festival. Um, we'll be talking about a few of his projects that have screened, but also his greater career um, and you know his his projects preceding. Uh, his intersection with dance cinema and with the festivals. And I'm really excited because he's had a, a long arc of work and a, a variety of, um, and, you know, as you said, the everyman, he's kind of like the Swiss army knife of dance and film. So it's nice to, to I'm looking forward to getting your perspective on things because I know you have a lot to offer. Uh, I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> You shall not. So how about Stephen? Why don't you start? I mean, I could talk about you all day, but why don't you introduce yourself to our audience uh, in a way that, that you would like them to meet you? <laughs> okay. um, hi there, everyone out there in podcast land. My name's Stephen Butler. I like to dance and do films and create things. Um, I was born in D.C., raised all over the place, military family, and I got into art. I guess when I was around 16, 17, I became a dancer and started taking classes. And that just led me on this whole journey pathway into everything. So I guess we'll get into that later. But, yeah. But yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I want to start with your TED Talk because um, mm-hmm. we can really get in the weeds on the details of like why you chose this, why you chose that for your films. But your TED Talk really showed your philosophy and was an invitation for people to see dance in a new way. Can you tell us like for... By the way, everyone listening, please search it up. It was at TEDx Pasadena, yes. correct? Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe it was like October 2018, something like that. September. I think it came out in October, November. I think that's when it actually released. But I actually did the talk, yeah. talk on September 23rd, 2018. <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so why don't you share a bit about what was included in that talk? Because I know I was, you know, as someone that knows you already, I was like, wow, I, I'd never heard Stephen put, arrange his thoughts in this way. And I just yeah. thought it was... Fantastic. Um, well, TED Talks are really hard <laughs> and really difficult and take a lot of, a lot of time. Um, but this particular talk was about my, my process as a creative, creative and as a choreographer, basically. And um, the way that I hear and see music is, is sort of different than other people, I would say. And that's sort of where it came from. Um, I mean, I can go into the process of doing the TED Talk overall, but um, I did six drafts. Of, five different talks, no, actually 20 drafts of five different talks. Um, and then I came to this one being the best one based on like audience feedback and my coaches and things like that. Um, but it was really hard for me to share my own personal like life and creative process. I'm a really private person. Um, so it was kind of cool and, and different for me and like actually was a huge growing moment for me um, to open up to the world Mm-hmm. And and let people in on what's going on in my head. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even though I sound crazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you could you tell us a little bit about how you hear music differently? Because uh, I know that was really fascinating. I don't. You don't have to rehash the entire <laughs> talk, and everyone yeah. that's listening to this yeah. should listen to that. But I yeah. think it'll lead nicely into mm-hmm. talking about how you make creative decisions for your specific projects. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, um, I have what's called synesthesia, and it basically means I I see music and colors and, and, and shapes and things like that. Um, and so it's something that like, I didn't realize until maybe like halfway through my dance career, I guess, you know? Um, but once I started choreographing fully and like, and, and, and becoming more of a, a complete artist is when I actually started to like find these things out and was able to like harness them and use them for my, for my benefit. So in my Ted talk, I talk about that specifically. And I and 
the anchor of the talk is basically like um, kind of roasting um, <laughs> dan- dance TV shows and how mm-hmm. they're all about like how many tricks can you do, how many turns, how many jumps and, and stuff and not necessarily about like the artistic over, overlay, that's the word I want to say. Just like the, the, the way the choreographer is, is presenting his work or her work or their, their work. And, um, and my, from my point of view, it's always been about musicality and the way you can like show music through dance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with that said, I mean, your work and you collaborate a lot with the films that you make or that you make together with your collaborator. Um, and technicality, musicality, and color is some of those themes that you touch on. Can you talk about those films, um, specifically talk about Confrontation as well as Tellurian? Um, well, everyone loves Confrontation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a really great film, film but um, that project specifically was from my creative partner, Shannon, her name is Shannon Janet Smith. She was a co-director on the project. Um, that was from her brain. And I basically like sat with her, talked with her through her, her ideas, her, and, and what she wanted to do with the project. Mm-hmm. And then we created a, a way to like visually show it and stuff. So I guess, yeah, a lot of that is sort of coming from the way that I like see like movement and stuff, but I want to be clear that it was like all her creative vision and stuff. I just basically like directed it and made it look cool. Yeah. Um, but as far as like your question, Oh, that's a good, that's a, I mean, it's a really good question. I don't know. I don't think I could break it down that way, but I will say that like, um, the way we shot it was not based on like the actual music that we, that you see in the film. We yeah. shot it separately. So like uh, the camera movements, all those were based on feeling and emotion and the, the and the, the movement mm-hmm. that was created that Shannon created. So, yeah. and then in the editing process, which I did not edit, it was a great uh, guy. His name is Devin Shiro. He's also the DP of the, the film. Um, he took those those visuals and made them really sing. So yeah, there's yeah. so much emotion in that work. Mm-hmm. You know, you feel. I mean, for those who haven't seen it, it's you know art coming to life, basically, yes. and how we look at something, and you do feel that, and it's and the music coming afterwards, you, it enhances that feeling that you get. I'm looking at a picture right now. I'm not really feeling much, but I am feeling, (laughs) you know, the cold blues in it. And Mm. I I remember seeing that you're, it's very intimate because it's just you and the work in front of you and Mm. what that art moves you, how it moves you. Yeah. I'm curious how that translated in your other work um, in Tellurian. So Tellurian um, was a collaboration with my girlfriend. Her name's Carissa Ashley. Um, she's a great choreographer, a great dancer, and overall creative person. Yes, she is. She's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so she had this idea of um, working through some, I guess, issues she had, like, you know, personal issues and stuff, and putting that on film. And I figured out a way to to capture it visually. So um, her, it was basically about enmeshed relationships. And, um, and so I came with the idea to use GoPros and have like very like, um, POV, like very intimate POV shots and cut them together with like very, very wide shots to show like the different perspectives of it. Um, and that just sort of came for me, like watching rehearsals, seeing the way that like the movement was coming together. And then like, and then like, what's the best way to do this? Cause originally I wanted to do well, one shot. But I was like, I can't really show like what I want to show, even though it'd be easier and less way less editing. But, but yeah, so that was that project. Oh, that's enough information. But <laughs> mm-hmm. I, <don't> know. <laughs> I really appreciate how mm-hmm. you are. You're like a catalyst in your projects. You're mm-hmm. like a dream collaborator. You go in and you say, how do I translate what's living in your brain and mm-hmm. put it on a screen or put it on a stage? That's incredibly valuable. And I think that a lot of people are like wishing on a star for that kind of person to work with. So Thank you for doing that for the projects that you've been in. And it's it's really interesting to see, you know, across your projects. I can still kind of tell it's a Stephen Butler influence in there, even though you're working with other people. Um, and that's a beautiful thing to be able to, to shift and have a flexible voice like that. You've had lots of different roles within film and within dance. Can you speak a bit about maybe your career journey? Or <laughs> we're speaking in, in 2019 and, you know, obviously 
YouTube's a thing, Vimeo's a thing, the internet, Instagram's a thing. This has all really changed the climate even in the past five years. But what about if we rewind like 10 years, 15 years? Is there anything that has been like maybe a major shift with technology or with society where you're like, wow, this really changes how I'm making things because now Instagram's a thing or now, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. (laughs) Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I will say that, like, I used to be really reluctant to put things online, like mm-hmm. YouTube and, and, and Instagram, all these things. I always wanted to, like, like, sort of hoard my art and, like, find the right place to put it out. And everyone was like, you have all this, like, content. I have so many, like, projects that I've never put out. Um, and I'm now, like, how many years later? YouTube's been around since, what, 2007? I have, like, like, almost, like, what, over a decade later, like, I'm now finally being okay with putting things on the internet and, like, trying to, like, showcase my work in different ways. Um, my very first film, short film that I did um, was actually my, still my most successful one as far as views. Um, it's called Run, Michael, Run. It's about, my, it's about Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> about Michael Jackson getting into, like, um, I guess a, an altercation with some gangsters. And they chase him. Basically, that's what the film's about. And it has like over 500,000 views on, on YouTube, which is crazy, mm-hmm. you know, to me. Yeah. Um, but like, I didn't even want to put it out. Actually, my friend posted it on his page because I was like, I'm not putting this anywhere. You know, this was before he passed away and also before all the other stuff that happened. What I'm trying to find out now is like the balance of like saving certain art forms for things like dance festivals and saving certain projects for like just to put out in general, you know. Mm hmm. Can you speak to maybe before you were creating content, how, how was your journey from, okay, I'm, I'm identified as a dancer or someone that's interested in art. How did you navigate your career through that? Because you're doing all sorts of interesting, different things. And I, I know a question for a lot of people is how do I actually make the thing I want to make? Where do I get the funding? How do I get a job in this? And it's really cool to see you actually making it happen and like doing all these different projects and making it a career and not a quote unquote hobby um, Mm -hmm. necessarily. So do you, are you asking like, how did I get into it? Or like, how how did I transition from dance to film or like? I guess what's, what's the journey? Like, because you probably didn't, you know, you probably weren't a teenager and saying, oh, I want to be making dance films for dance film festivals and programming and blah, blah, blah. Right. Because they maybe were not as in the forefront of your mind. So what's kind of that journey from, I want to do this for a thing and now I'm doing the thing. Okay. I mean, I'll go to the very beginning. Like the first thing I wanted to do as a creative person was I wanted to be an architect when I was a little kid. And then I was like really bad at math. So I was like, that's not going (laughs) to, that's not going to work out. And then like, I started discovering these other ways of create, of creativity, like dance and choreography and, and music. Um, And I was in choir and I used to play the trumpet. And then for some reason, like I just really got into dance and I was good at it really, really fast. Or I guess early, not at early age, but like when I I started like taking classes, Mm -hmm. it just started coming naturally to me. Um, And so from there, um, I wanted to choreograph like right away. So I started choreographing the same time I started taking dance classes, which I was around 15 or 16. Um, And then went to school for dance, but quit because I was like, this is not what I want to do. As mm-hmm. far as like um, how people tell me like that I'm not good enough to 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 be a, a professional dancer, and um, so then I proved them wrong and got a job. My first dance, my second dance job actually was at Bush Gardens in Tampa Bay. <laughs> my first dance job was uh, uh, Six Flags Over Texas, where I played Marvin the Martian. Oh great... yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was like only like maybe six months after I started dancing. Um, but then like the real, the real transition happened when I came up to LA to audition for scholarship at the edge. Um, and I'm sad to say that that program is pretty much done now. It's evolved into something else, mm. but it was a great program for people to like become dancers and, be- and get into the industry and meet all these like amazing directors and choreographers. I met like everyone from like Paul Abdul to like, and Brian Friedman, like he was a lot younger back then, but like all these people like were part of my like circle. And then, like, well, as I started working and dancing and going on tour and stuff, I started, like, choreographing for artists and different people and realized that, like, I like the, the behind the scenes and the creative aspects of, like, creating something that, that's going to go on stage or go on film and, like, knowing that, like, it came from here and I can see it happen, you know? So that's, like, the, the beauty of it for me. So from there, being a choreographer and a, assisting bigger choreographers, like, 
I start helping out directors to, to stage dance scenes. And that's when I really realized that like, I was already directing stuff all the whole time I'd been choreographing. And so I wanted to like learn how to not just be the, the, the director that's like, oh, put that camera over there, do that, what kind of lens is that? I wanted to know exactly what the lens was, exactly what the frame was, exactly how to edit some. I wanted to know like all the technical terms plus lighting. And so I went to film school and literally going through all of it. No, it's good. <laughs> this is great. This is exactly, yeah. 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 So then I went to film school. And then from there, like, um, everyone was like obsessed with me as far as like my no that's not the sound that's not really bad. um but my skill set of, of having danced and, and worked as a choreographer before like mm -hmm. i was doing everyone's projects i was choreographing people since so casting for people and doing my own stuff and i just realized how valuable dance was as far as like cinematic cinematically speaking you know um one of my favorite uh, instructors his name is jp he's this cool french guy who knows everything about cinema cinema like <laughs> and, uh, and he was He's like, I think the purest art, the purest form of cinema is dance. Like it, the way that it's like shot and stuff. It's it's like the most cinematic thing that you can like put on screen. I have goosebumps from that. Yeah. So yeah. if you think about like some of those old scenes and stuff, like um, with um, like Bob Fosse or mm -hmm. or like uh, you know Fred and Ginger and these yeah. things, and like how like they were just like shot so perfectly. Um, so like just taking that whole history and then applying that to like the things that I wanted to do was sort of like how I got into doing more dance films. But also from music videos, it was like, how can I like not just put the camera in front of a whole bunch of dancers and have them like go crazy and like say, oh, this is a cool dance. How can I like move it different ways? Um, and like realizing that like they were innovating way more than people are now, you know? Like if you think about like any music video in the last like 10 years, like there's dance scenes from, from, from movies in the sixties that will blow it out of the water as far as the way it's shot and stuff. So trying to like take those techniques and put it to stuff now, is basically it. So a so. catalyst for your career was moving to LA or, or decision. And mm -hmm. um, do you yeah. mind sharing like what year that was or generally what, <laughs> generally what time that was just for perspective? Sure. For, yeah. Yeah, I'm basically really old. No, uh, <laughs> You're not. that's not what my question was. Yeah. I moved to L.A. in 1998. So I was on the Edge Scholarship program from 98 to 99. And I started dancing professionally in L.A. at the end of 99. So how was how L.A. 1998 versus 2019? Yeah. What what have you observed? Hmm. And I mean, you're still there. So yeah. clearly it's a, it's a good place to live and work. And just a big jump. Yeah. Of... A lot of things. I'm Everything. not going to go into it. I want to hear what you have to say about Everything. it. Everything. <laughs> 98 and now, I mean, there's a million things that are different. Um, dancers, the okay, this is the, to me, this is the most beautiful thing. It's probably like not what you think I'm going to say, but now nowadays, if you are a really good dancer and you happen to be mildly attractive or just, or maybe not even mildly attractive, you're just really good, right? And you know how to present yourself to the world, you can actually become a star in your own right without having to dance behind anyone, without having to be on a movie, without having to like, you know, have an agent even, or not even have, you don't have to live in LA. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so some of these kids are making like three Gs a post or 10,000. I mean, these kids that have like all these followers, they're touring around, like doing their own classes and stuff and selling their own merchandise. I think that's really cool. So I think that's, to me, like, if I was a dancer now, I would probably strive to be that dancer and not the dancer behind someone only because it means that I'm in control of my own career, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're not worried about if this choreographer likes me or if I piss this person off, am I going to get blacklisted from this? If my agent drops me, like, you know, like, there's all these, like, things that dancers have to worry about as far as, like, their career is concerned, so. You just have to worry about if all those million and two people <laughs> still like you. Well, yeah, <laughs> like, you know, if you end up, doing something really stupid you probably could lose your, your whole following you know mm -hmm. but there's i mean it's it's a catch-22 because there are so many people that have the, the most following that are viral dancers that in my opinion aren't the best or that the most talented but they have something that people like yeah mm -hmm. so you know if yeah. you didn't live in la where would you choose to live and work in mm -hmm. dance in film mm -hmm. maybe not in either maybe it's like i'd rather be a farmer <laughs> if i wasn't doing this in la or you could be an architect. Go back to yeah. that. <laughs> I don't know. I want to live in like Paris. I want to be something, something romantic or like Malta or like just live somewhere like different and then just create stuff. You know, mm -hmm. if I had a whole bunch of money, I would just like live somewhere else and then fly out to LA when I needed to. And then, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going back to what we were dancing around, just saying it, 
the bit, the huge jump of just technology in general. Yeah. Yes. Where specifically talking about a following, an internet following, and just how that has changed the whole scope of how we look at a lot of forms of art yeah. and specifically dance because I mean we have these you know internet dancers I'm totally of course blanking on the names right now but you know they have a huge following and it's just because what they're doing is so different and again we're just seeing it right here it's a available and easy to ex accessibility you know right here on our phones and a lot of them are based in LA. Yeah. It's too easy of a segue not to lean into this one. So <laughs> speaking of dancing behind yeah. people, is there anyone that we know that maybe you have danced behind or danced with or because I think kind of the the economy and the social um, environment has changed a bit that you're right. Everyone is kind of their own publisher, their own dancer, their own creator. But there still are. I mean, my husband and I went to go see a Janet Jackson show a couple of years ago, and it was amazing that she was bringing local dancers from the community to perform in those tour cities. So I think that's kind of a lost art in some ways is actually having um, as a mainstream thing, having like your backup dancers. Like mm. some people have that, but it's not I, I don't think it's the same. Maybe it's just what I'm exposed to. But what can you speak to about? you know, your experience with that? And maybe did was there a change at any point where? that wasn't a thing as much or, you know what I'm saying? Um, well, I mean, I dance for a few artists. The one the, the one that most people know me for is I dance for Aaron Carter for um, two to three years straight, basically. So I choreographed for him as well, or one of, was one of his choreographers. I wouldn't say it was his, his only, but one of his choreographers and danced for him. Uh, multiple tours, opening for Britney Spears and opening for NSYNC and, and, and doing like major headlining tours all around the world. And he was like a, a great person to work with, even though he was a little kid, but like he has a lot of natural talent and stuff. Um, and then I were also worked with Ludacris and Macy Gray and Paulina Rubio and a few other people that you may have heard of. Um, but my, I guess when I stepped away from backup dancing was when like, I, there are certain instances that happened where like you realize that like you were literally just you're 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 not important to anyone until you're once you're like done with that job. Maybe like there's some people that still appreciate you as a dancer, but as far as that fan base, you know, like I we used to have like these little internet like um, fan like we had like uh, fan clubs, we had white websites based on us like and stuff. And then like as soon as the dancers would switch, they would just like <laughs> take your stuff down and then put the the replacement in. And Ouch. it's like yeah, you know, like, um, or like how come you're not dancing for so and so anymore? And like you know, it's just this weird thing. Um, but it wasn't that I wouldn't, I would, I mean, I guess in a perfect world, I would still go on tour with someone. When things changed for me was when I realized that like, my whole dream was based on like being someone else's support system, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's the, there's nothing cooler than, than walking on stage and hearing 20,000 people like, you know, scream or whatever, you know, and people know your names and stuff like that. It's it's really cool feeling. But it would be cool to do that knowing like it was for me and not for this other person. Yeah. Is that part of what maybe attracted you to something that's collaborative like film is you can have a role or two that's not just a visual like I'm doing this count of eight, you know, you're integrated in the project. And I can see how maybe that sort of experience did shape your your value of individual agency, not mm -hmm. just as an artist, but as a creator. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's completely it. It's like, I've always wanted to be, I mean, I mean, I always love, love writing. I love like doing music and all these different things. I like the aspect of creating something from, not from scratch or maybe from scratch or maybe from other things and putting it out there. As a dancer, the the fun part of, the fun part for me was always the rehearsal process mm -hmm. and like getting the moves and hanging out with people. And then performing was like, it's only like not before you get on stage. It's like only when you're on stage and that's it. You know what I mean? It's like right. that was the, the good part for me. But like the process was really like what I really loved. But as a creative, that's from the ideation point, from the meeting with people, from like the the crew, if it's a film, you know, doing storyboards, like the whole process is like that, you know, that energy that you get like to make something new with people. So so because of that switch, you know, you're dancing for someone and then going to film and then you're, you and you were saying you have that one moment on stage versus being a creative. 
there's more to that. What are you trying to, what, what is that special something that you're trying to say to audiences than what you were doing saying to audiences as a performer? Yeah. <laughs> he has something to say too. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I think what it is is like, it's more like telepathy, I guess. Like, you know, when you write something, someone reads it and like they're in your head. When you come up with an idea and then you put it out in the world, like you're actually sharing what came from here and then giving it to people. As a dancer, you're really sharing this emotion and this joy or whatever, or pain or whatever it is that you're doing. And that's in the, it's a fleeting moment and it's done. And maybe it might stay with people for a long time, but it's not the same thing. It doesn't give me the same satisfaction of knowing that like, or even just watching the creation, you, you know, like, I mean, it's, just, it's like I have a God complex or something, but like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I like just seeing something that I made and put into the world. So um, we've been asking everyone this and you probably have heard this before, but what is, what is screen dance? What is your, what is your <laughs> definition of screen dance? That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, to me, it's anything that is that is visual, visually based, um, moving images. Um, basically, that's it. Like, no, but um, <laughs> particularly like with choreography or some type of choreography involved, whether that's editing or whether that's um, dancing, whether that's fight choreography, whether that's like a couple like sparring with like words but then like it's shot a cool way it could be camera movements like i mean there's so many different things but it's like that's what it encompasses to me and it doesn't have to be um i still think that like youtube videos or instagram videos could be screen dance you know it's just a different like genre of screen dance you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think i think it's just such a it's i i like that we've been asking this question mm -hmm. because you know it is there's just so many ways of how we can interpret it you know and you know everything that we're watching on a screen or some a wall could be a screen you know it could be interpreted as screen dance yeah i agree and i think it's it's sort of like in the way that hip-hop hip-hop well maybe not now but the way it was originally <laughs> meant to be like for everyone to create and try new things and like and it was you know you could you could put this kind of music, you could put bossa nova with it, you could put like jazz, you could do anything. And it was like, and then as long as you were pure to like that art form, then it was cool. And I feel like that's the same thing with screen dance where it doesn't matter what type of choreography you're doing, doesn't matter what type of movement, doesn't matter if you're doing this stupid push in and out camera movement or if you're doing something, <laughs> yeah. like it doesn't matter, but it's inclusive to everyone mm -hmm. to create something that that celebrates their like way of movement, moving, I guess. Yeah. It's stemming off now, Jen. You have you like to use the term dance cinema. Yes, ma'am. And now my question for you: Would you want to stick with the word screen dance? Or do you think would you have your own type of word or Stupid or dance. many of the words that we have defined before? What is your way of actually, I guess, one wording at screen dance or two wording? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I like Jen Ray's dance cinema, but like it's from my snooty, like film, like school grad, you know, perspective that like, you know, that's more highbrow and more like elevated like art form. It's like, you know, you're making something specifically to showcase either on a big screen or to look to be looked at compared to like movies and film and of, of yesteryears or whatever. Um, and screen dance means it's more inclusive and open to everyone to like create art is what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, for my, if I was going to, if I was going to make a, my own term, I don't know. I mean, dance is just so cool. I just want it to be called cool dance. I don't know. Like, like, <laughs> Steven dance. Yeah. Like, I don't, I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But I think there's somewhere in between your two phrases. I think that's where it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me anyways, because I do both. I do high art, I guess, and I do like super like, you know, twerking videos or something. And well, actually, I do have one of those, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and just for context for people that uh, maybe this is their first recording listening or they're like, mm -hmm. what's the word dance cinema? Um, for me, I see it as similar to what you were saying. You look at, you strip away the 
what is the thing I'm looking at? And you look at the core elements, how is rhythm, movement, um, the languages of dance and film, but also music, design, how are these general elements integrated and what is the process that combines dance and film? Um, so I, I would not call a class music, like a class video, a dance cinema. I, I would call it a class video or I would call it a dance video. Um, and that's not to be like, it's not worthy, but it's just, it's a different type of thing. Um, yeah, I just think it's different. And then, you know, screen dance, of course, it, you know, that's an excellent term. Uh, it just doesn't roll off my tongue <laughs> in the same way. And uh, for me, dan dance cinema is, is the word, but I understand. And I, I like when people have different labels for it because it is just semantics at the end of the day. You pick the words that speak to you and then you create the frame around it that's like, this is what it means to me. And I think that's the beauty of it is that you, there are endless combinations and possibilities and who knows, in two years we'll be making up some other word, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, right now I'm working on a VR project. So I'd even know that that's, there's not a screen and, or it's, it's, there's like AR stuff. So like what, now what do you call that? You it's know still mean? dance cinema. Okay, fair, <laughs> enough. fair enough. Yeah. So, but, yeah. yeah. Are there any uh, strains of things that you would classify not screen dance or dance cinema? Mm. No. <laughs> Everything's all That's good. fine. That's totally fine. We can do that. Well, yeah. well, what else are you working on? So you're working on a VR project next. Can you share yes. anything about that? Or um, uh, one of the one of my TEDx cohort cohorts. Her name's Nancy. Um, she is a fine artist and she does a lot of like 3d like work she has her own app called the fourth wall um where she does like these like amazing like 3d drawings and puts some places in the world like and a lot of like political art and stuff like that um so i'm working with her to, to create something for the sundance new frontiers lab and hopefully like nice. it all works out but you know it's in the beginning stages we've only had like three meetings now um but either way it'll go somewhere i just don't know where but like hopefully it'll be at sundance not the next year, but the year after. Very 2020, cool. 2021, yeah. Do you have any wishes of like where you wish to see screen dance or dance cinema in the next, you know, so on years? Like where, like, I know VR is like one step moving forward, but is there anything else that you kind of wish to see or you, you strive to make? Well, I mean, I was in the airport today and like I was speaking with this lady and she was asking me about what's coming to Vancouver and I was telling her, and then like the first thing she asked me, you know, about this dance film festival is like, well, how do you make money from that? And I was like, well, it's a labor of love as of now, you know? Um, but like, if you look at some of these other videos that are getting like, I don't know, like billion, like not billions. I think some of these dance videos have like almost a billion views, you know, mm -hmm. which is crazy if you think about it, you know, there's room for like the art to be in there as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, how can you bridge those gaps so you bring that audience that loves the watching that loves watching dance and have them come and watch something different? You know, that's where that's where I feel like it needs to go. Yeah, definitely yeah. for real, for real. Um, well, do you have any final words? Steve? I love dancing. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm happy to, to do this with you know. This is like really cool. It's my only it's my second podcast I've ever been on. So. Yeah. Really cool. Well, where can we find you? Uh, if for those listeners who are so interested, how can we find you um, and your work? Okay. If you would like to follow my travels and artistic adventures, um, I'm on Instagram at Stephen J Butler underscore Stephen with a V. Um, you can also see my, I guess, my portfolio of work at Stephen J Butler dot net. And that's pretty much it. We hope you enjoyed this talk with Stephen Butler. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Screen Dance Forum, for making it possible. It's that time now where we share some upcoming events and opportunities, so here goes. Utah Dance Film Festival, based in Salt Lake City, Utah, is accepting submissions for their ninth annual festival happening May 2021. Regular deadline is November 30th, so don't wait too long to submit your film. What are your plans this weekend? Netflix and chill? How about Dance Cinema and chill? Head to the link in the show notes to explore Dance Cinema's 2020 program of short dance films and documentaries, including Corn Screen Dance and our Capital and Cascadia Festival selections. 
In the Washington, D.C. metro region, Dance Cinema is hosting the fourth annual Capital Dance and Cinema Festival at Eaton Workshop this Saturday, October 10th. We've only got a handful of spots left, so send us a DM at the link in the show notes to get on the list. That's all for this week. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe, leave us a review, follow us on social at FrameformPod, and share this podcast with a friend. Tune in next Wednesday for another great episode of Frameform. Frameform is a production of Rixie, hosted by me, Hannah Weber, Claire Schweitzer, and Jen Wright. Edited and mixed by myself and Mason Carlton. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>